Okay, hello everyone and welcome to our August Wamisa seminar. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the Indigenous owners of the land I'm on today. So today I'm at Monash University in Victoria and our universities are on the land of the people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Indigenous Australians are the oldest continuous culture and they were the first Australian earth and environmental scientists. So we have a lot to learn from them and their deep knowledge of the Australian land and the environment. So the Wamisa seminar series is about showcasing the amazing work of women in earth and environmental science in Australasia. As well as the live seminars, we also have um, collated recordings from seminars that are hosted by other organizations and available online. So we've put those together and put them all up on our website so you can go check them out. It's a great resource as well. Um, so from next month, the live series will actually be on the second Wednesday of the month. So this is the first Wednesday of the month this month, but next, next month we're changing. The next one will actually be on September 8th. You can sign up as a member of WOMESA to get a notification of upcoming seminars, or you can follow us on Twitter um, to get those notifications as well. So today's seminar is going to be presented by Dr. Jacqueline Helpen, who is a geologist and senior lecturer with the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies at the University of Tasmania in Hobart. So Jackie completed her undergraduate and honours studies at the University of Melbourne and a PhD at the University of Sydney on the thermotectonic evolution of the one billion year old Rainer origin in East Antarctica. In 2007, she moved across to Tasmania and has since worked across multiple teaching and research roles at several Australian universities, which she says is code for 12 years of uh, too many fixed term part-time part -time contracts. So her research has taken her across Australia, New Zealand, Vietnam, Central Africa, the Indian Ocean and Antarctica. She's interested in all sorts of geological problems, especially how continents have been built and reshaped over millions and billions of years. She also really enjoys collaborating widely. Jacqueline is currently focused on Antarctica, applying her research to interdisciplinary problems, including ice sheet history and ice sheet modeling. So I will hand over to you, Jackie. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Melanie and the Wameza team for inviting me along to share some of my research and experiences today. So as I'm joining you from Lutrawita, Tasmania, I'd also like to acknowledge the Palawa people as the traditional owners and ongoing custodians of this land and pay my respect to their elders past, present and future. So the vibe of the talk today is to give some insight into the challenges and techniques used to understand subglacial Antarctica. How are we moving to a, a better picture of a complex continent and why is that important that we do. And then I'm going to take the opportunity to highlight um, some of the Antarctic research that I've been involved with in the last couple of years. And that's mainly through my wonderful HDR students and some ECRs that I've worked with. So I'm going to introduce them as we go along as well. And then I'm going to wrap up at the end with some reflections on my career and some of the challenges um, that may be familiar to you as well. Sorry. I'm trying to progress the slide. I'll click here. Okay, so how did I get to now uh, in my current role as an Antarctic geologist? Well, it certainly wasn't planned for me. Um, I have my parents to thank for the kind of early outdoor adventures. Um, as kids, my brother and I used to go to the bush really regularly. We had a block up at Lansfield in Victoria. So there's beautiful granite landscape up there, climbing over boulders. And then we'd go on road trips as well with my family all through Australia um, during school time, which was, you know, fantastic to miss school and, and see Central Australia, Northern Australia. Um, so we had, a, we had a great um, kind of love of the outdoors. And my mum was also a medical scientist. So science in our family was pretty normal, but she was a microbiologist. And I knew that I didn't want anything to do with people's blood or guts or anything like that. So that wasn't for me. Um, but there was, a there was a turning point towards geology, I think, when I started at Melbourne Uni. I didn't study it at school, but I'd chosen a, a very broad art science combined degree because I'm just hopeless at making decisions. And I was just like, I'll just keep my you know, options open for as long as possible. Um, and I thought about architecture. I still do sometimes. I thought about doing astrophysics. Um, but in those early weeks, my friend and I went to an introductory lecture on earth sciences, and I just... I just thought, you know, what's that sounds okay. 
Um, but we had completely different reactions to that hour. And I came out thinking, wow, you know, you can learn to, to, to read the landscape. That's definitely what I want to do. And my friend said that she could think of nothing worse than destroying the beauty of nature with science. So um, I took that geology route. She ended up as a psychologist. And we agree about most things in life, except, except that. <laughs> so um, so I, that was my, my route from then on. Um, but my taste for Antarctica came with an opportunity at Sydney Uni for a PhD with Jeff Clark and Richard White. And I had two trips to Antarctica during that time. They were really life-changing experiences, uh, even just getting there was an adventure. There's a photo in the middle there of one of the ships we were on. And our field work was quite remote most of the time. So we were, you know, at times hundreds of kilometres from station, um, travelling on mainly on quad bikes, pulling sleds and living out of tents and little field huts. Um, so, yeah, quite an adventure. After my PhD, I moved to Tasmania and I thought that was kind of a temporary thing while my partner finished his PhD, but I'm still here after 15 years. Um, and in the past five years, I've had the opportunity to work on Antarctic geoscience again, which has been really great. So I'll share with you today some of the, um, the work that I've been doing in that time. So let's take a look now on the, at the Antarctic continent. It's really, really huge. And it's about 1.7 times the size of Australia. And over 99.8% is covered with the ice sheet. So they're not really good odds for a geologist at all. And I put the call out on Twitter the other day to get some, some stats on on some areas closer to home. And I don't, I should have included the New Zealanders there, but I didn't. Um, but thanks to all that replied, I got some great numbers out of Australia. So for comparison, there's sort of 11% maybe in New South Wales, 22% in Northern Territory, 21 in WA, maybe up to 25 in South Australia, but certainly a lot less in places like the Gaul or Craton where there might be maximum 3% outcrop. So um, this kind of this kind of chatter led to all sorts of ex existential discussion around what's a what's an outcrop, what's a rock, what's cover, what's cover cover, um, <laughs> these sorts of things, and it, it was a lot of fun. So thanks to all those that joined in. But if we could peer underneath the Antarctic ice sheet, we'd see, of course, um, a very complex uh, and um, rugged place, and, and of course that's what we'd expect. So we can see features reminiscent of more familiar continents um, like mountain chains. We have the, the big Trans-Antarctic mountain range here, inland massifs, the Gembertsev subglacial mountains here, rift valleys like the Lambert Rift and the West Antarctic Rift through here. And there's lowland basins like the Aurora and the Wilkes basins in here. Inland lakes like Bostock is, is very famous. And one of the examples of the surprises in the interior that we didn't know about until this sort of radar technology was available is that the Gambits of subglacial mountains, this, this broad area through here, they're equal in size to the European Alps. And this radar cross section shows just a small part of it. You can see the layering in the ice here, the stratigraphy in the ice. And then you can see the sharp peaks and valleys of the mountains below. And all of this is under kilometers of ice. So there's no exposure at all. Um, and the landscape's thought to have originally been carved by rivers. And you can see this sort of beautiful dendritic river network in the image on the left there. So that was before it was glaciated. But we still don't really understand how the Gambirds of Mountains formed. Um, they're such an impressive mountain range, but, but there's still a lot of um, controversy of how they formed and, and why they're still there, actually. But they would have been a key starting point for the ice sheet that eventually spread out to cover the whole continent. So as an Antarctic geologist, the, um, the challenges of that ice sheet and the remoteness of Antarctica um, require some sort of re res resourceful thinking, I'd say. Um, we can definitely use outcrops where we can find them, um, and if we're lucky enough to have fieldwork supported. So I took this friend, uh, this photo, sorry, of my friend Luke Milan with a rock in his hand. It's part of the famous Morse and Tarnakite. Um, and so we have sampled where we've been able to. We can use the ice sheet as, as a kind of transport hub. And this image here shows um, that the ice sheet is not moving uniformly everywhere. The velocity changes. Uh, and so the, the warm colors are the fast flowing glaciers 
and they can move sort of precious material clues from the interior and out to the margins as moraines and we can sample those moraines and understand what's under the ice that way. We can also tap um, some geological information from icebergs that carve off the ice shelves. They drop this kind of detritus into the, onto the sea floor and we can collect that in sediments or uh, in, sorry, uh, dredges or sediment cores. And that can help us understand what's on shore. And of course we can use geophysics, which is a really powerful tool to understand what's under the ice. Um, and within the last sort of 10, 20 years, there's been huge international campaigns to, to really deliver some of these great data sets. Um, they're rev revolutioning our, our view under the ice. And we can also extrapolate what we know from better understood continents like Australia in this image here. We can, we can correlate structures across the margins. But to be honest, I think probably the, the secret and most powerful <laughs> weapon in, in my repertoire is, is people and collaboration. And to me, this aspect is the most enjoyable part, the most rewarding part of my job. Um, you know, rocks are okay, but people are a lot more fun, I think. And tapping into their rock collections, their data sets and their brains is, is something that I do regularly. So I mentioned earlier that I had a chance to get back into Antarctic geoscience, and this started as a postdoc with the Antarctic Gateway Partnership in late 2015. This was an ARC special research initiative, and I was part of a program that had a focus on the interactions between the, the solid earth and the ice sheet. And I discovered during this time that there's a whole other language around Antarctica. So it turns out that I just don't see the ice when I think about Antarctica. I just see geology and I even see the unseeable bits. I just imagine geology everywhere. And I discovered that glaciologists don't think like that. Um, and they've got many different types of ice. So I had to learn a whole nother vocabulary. Um, they spoke of this thing called the, the bed. <laughs> and I was kind of taken aback. I think, what's the bed? Are you talking about a rock or a sediment or a till or water? Or, um, so it was part of my role to understand what the knowledge of, of the bed could do for a non-geologist. And of course, there's all sorts of things. So how the ice sheet behaves is a, is a consequence of what it's sitting on top of. And that's a complex continent with over 3.8 billion years of history in some places. So in this sense, the geology provides the template for the ice sheet um, in aspects such as the topography, the nature of the substrate that the ice moves on, the geothermal heat distribution. And an example on the left shows the bedrock dipping away from the margin here, meaning that inland areas uh, are below sea level and they're very vulnerable to incursion by warm water onto the shelf. Um, and, we, and that can set up a sort of a runaway scenario um, and there's large areas of Antarctica that are today sitting below sea level. We can see some of them in this top figure and they're very vulnerable to this, this um, ice sheet retreat. The um, geological record also records change. For example, we can explore past ice sheet configurations from onshore erosion patterns. Um, we can look at continental margin deposits and it's also a driver of change in the cryosphere. So, Subglacial volcanism, for example, that can drive melting, but conversely, as um, the ice sheet unloads, that may also uh, lead to more volcanism. And when, when we change the ice load, we can also change the, the lithosphere, we, we also cause the lithosphere to rebound, um, which in some ways um, may stabilize the effects of ice sheet retreat. So with time, um, these processes are kind of related and, and with time that the template forming uh, geological aspects can, can become um, recorders of change and drivers of change themselves. So there's interactions and feedbacks between the continent and the cryosphere that I'm sort of only beginning to understand and I, I find it really fascinating. And my uh, postdoc role allowed me to kind of tackle two aspects in parallel, this sort of fundamental geological evolution and also I concentrated on geothermal heat flow. And so of course those two things are linked and I'll cover a bit on each of those today. So I'm now also part of another SRI ACES that starts in coming months. And we're gonna continue this sort of work and expand it out into the ocean and the atmosphere as well. So what do we know? And what do we know that we don't know about Antarctic geology? Well, this is the first GIS data set describing the exposed bedrock and superficial geology 
of Antarctica, and it's only recently been compiled in the last few years. And this was called the GMAP project. It was led out of GNS in New Zealand, um, and they compiled information over decades of mapping projects. Um, and some of the workhorses actually were students from IMS here, and they were working to digitize the legacy Australian maps. It's a fantastic contribution, and it illustrates that East Antarctica is made up of Precambrian rocks largely, including Archean blocks um, that go back as far as 3.8 billion years, and also Proterozoic origins forming during several supercontinent cycles. West Antarctica, this area over here, it's generally younger and it formed mainly between 590 million years ago along the active um, continent convergence zone, ocean continent convergence zone that bordered the ancient Pacific margin of Gondwana. So in terms of plate reconstructions, Antarctica is recognized as a keystone in Gondwana. And the main elements of the last 200 million years are quite well established. Um, they're fairly well accepted. And we have the sea floor to help us there, of course. Um, although it can be a bit complex in places, especially where we have um, large igneous provinces and, and so on. But the, in general, the main elements of the last 200 million years are fairly well accepted. But what about when we get beyond 200 million years? What about the amalgamation of Gondwana and previous supercontinent cycles? Well, that's more controversial. So this model here shows um, how pieces of Antarctica may have collided to form Gondwana from 700 million years. And you can see the bits of Antarctica in white. So we have a bit connected to Australia, to Africa, to India, and those are moving independently and are all coming together towards Gondwana. But then we have bits of Antarctica that just kind of turn up in the model at various points in time. And that's because they're really quite poorly understood still. Um, and and we, need to, we need more constraints before we're able to, to model them properly. So this model also shows that the main elements here um, uh, of Gondwana are here, but the, the West Antarctica is still yet to form as well as Eastern, Eastern Australia and New Zealand. So I'm going to show now some examples of some of our research um, where we've been making some headway, and that's um, focused on East Antarctica. So the first example I'll show you here is a, from a study led by Jack Mulder. So here we were looking for evidence of a plate boundary um, between parts of East Antarctica that were previously related to India and parts that were related to Australia. Um, so plate tectonics plate tectonic reconstructions, like the movie we just saw, they suggest that there was thousands of kilometres of um, plate movement between Indo-Antarctica and Australo-Antarctica between about 770 million years and, and 520 million years. So they imply a closure of a really large ocean basin um, during what's called um, the development of the Kunga origin here in orange. But where that plate boundary or, or boundaries actually propagate into Antarctica is really poorly known. There's a few different ideas out there. And so in a separate study in 2018, we'd actually suggested that an important segment of that plate boundary might be exposed under the ice near Murney Station over here, um, between the green and the pink in this figure. Um, but it was difficult to prove because there's really very, very little outcrop in this area. Um, so in this study, we used some Holocene marine sediments that were offshore that Mooney region. You can see the locations here, Mooney stations here, the fault running through here. And these sediments were collected by a ship about 20 years ago. We were able to access them through an archive in the US. Um, and so we could use that sediment as a proxy for what's happening onshore. And we also used basement rock samples from across East Antarctica, where the little squares are here, uh, to understand more about the onshore source rocks. So first, we uh, in this study, we first analysed the lead isotopic signature of that feldspar, um, first from the in situ rocks. So the colours in this plot correlate with the colours in the map on the left. Um, and that those colours in the map are based on the new data, but also on geophysics and, and data that um, was already available. And the warm colours show uh, Indo-Antarctic provinces and the cool colours show Australo-Antarctic provinces and the same over here. 
And you can see that there's a distinction between those provinces which we use to our advantage in this study. So here, the figure that's overlain on the top shows the, the same data, but now it's contoured in the background. So Australia Antarctica is contoured in blue and the red shows Indo-Antarctica. And then on the top of that is our, our new detrital information from Felspar that we collected offshore. And um, you can see that, uh, that there's uh, a distinct signature of both Indo-Antarctica and Australia Antarctica in that detritus. And so that Australia Antarctica um, signal is particularly distinctive here. And so we suggest that there is a, a plate boundary in the, in the hinterland here, and that it's likely to be this many fault structure. Um, and that we also suggest that that many fault may link up to another structure in the uh, Gambard sub subglacial mountains. So in this model, there's a sort of a broad north trending striped slip plate margin, which is along here in the, in the model, which correlate, which then links up with a with a more um, uh, convergent collisional plate boundary in the interior, which defines the geometry of the Conga origin. And another uh, valuable outcome of this study was that feldspar is a really useful um, tracer. So it's a, it's a very common mineral. It's common to most rock types, and it appears to be really good at, at sort of defining geological regions in Antarctica and we can use that to our advantage to understand how the ice sheets change through time um, in future studies. So we've taken these sorts of approaches in other parts of Antarctica. This is just an example further east in Wilkesland. So now we're within that Australo Antarctic part of East Antarctica. This was led by Alessandro and Sean, these different uh, these two different studies. So this area it sits mainly below sea level. You can see the blues here. So it's a, it's a vulnerable area of Antarctica in terms of ice sheet retreat. Um, and the Totten Glacier, which sits in here, is one of the fastest retreating glaciers in East Antarctica. So it's, it's getting a fair bit of attention at the moment. So to find out more about the, the bedrock here, we used all sorts of things. We used um, some outcrop from Chick Island, this little location here. Um, we got some erratic samples of sandstones that have been spat out of glaciers over here in the Windmill Islands. So these are the only examples, these three little ones that we could find um, anywhere in any collections. Um, we also took some marine sediment cores off, offshore. You can see here this little pink dot which relates to this ice core here. Um, and there was of course um, geophysical data available. So there was magnetic data um, on the Antarctic side, but also on the Australian side. So we were able to use Australian data plus fantastic geological information from South Australia and use that to our advantage to interpret what was happening in East Antarctica. So in terms of new data sets, we collected um, zircon, monazite, apatite, titanite, feldspar. We sort of threw the kitchen sink at, at the samples we were able to get. And from those data, we were able to define an entirely new subglacial neoprotozoic sedimentary basin, which is this hashed area here, which we relate to the officer basin in Australia and we, and we um, suggest is related to Rodinia breakup and also an underlying, um, some underlying basement provinces that um, are primitive mesoproteozoic crust that we can relate to southern Australia. So moving from tiny mineral grains now around the coast to the continent scale, Here's an example of a clever way to go from sort of geolo geologists drawing lines <laughs> over Antarctica, which is a pretty common thing to do, um, to a group of models for the lithospheric structure of the Antarctic continent. So this work was led by Tobias Stahl, and we'll see more of his work on geothermal heat as well shortly. So the idea here was to map variations in geophysical data that suggests deep um, boundaries or transitions in the lithosphere. So he used three data sets, uh, seismic wave, shear wave speed, free air gravity and elevation. Um, and those data sets have consistent um, resolution across the East Antarctica, which is why they were used. So visual variations such as rapid or obvious changes in trends or patterns um, are selected as boundaries in the first stage and they're given accuracy ratings um, and precision ratings. And then um, these are the resulting likelihood maps. So um, the brighter shades here show where a boundary in the lithosphere is more likely based on that data set. 
And I just think they're just such beautiful theatrical images. Um, and Tobias then combined those images in various different ways. So I'm just showing one model here on the right. This is the intersect model. Um, so this is the, the sort of resulting multivariate um, output. Uh, and you can see um, there's a lot of structure predicted in the interior of Antarctica um, and also how that might relate to structures in Australia and at Gondwana fit. So although the data are um, targeted to the deeper lithosphere, they're also sensitive in this case to structure at different levels. And we actually find that there's good agreement with some major crustal boundaries that we can see at the surface. Uh, for example, the Mertz Glacier region in this little box here, it's got a very stark contrast between the Teradaly craton, which is Archean, um, and the younger Ross origin rocks to the east. And we see that at the surface uh, and that matches what we see in this lithosphere map. Um, and it also suggests that um, there have been some models that, that what's called the Mawson continent might extend across much of East Antarctica, taking in some of these locations, the Shackleton Range, even across to the Prince Charles Mountains. But that, those kind of models don't really hold up with this new lithosphere view. So I'm going to move now just to briefly describe some of the geothermal heat work we've been doing. So geothermal heat influences the thermal state of the ice, which impacts the rheology. So that is the ice viscosity and hence the, the um, internal deformation of the ice where it's flowing slowly. But it can also contribute to basal, basal melting and then that leads to sliding um, and all sorts of chaos. So because of that imp impact, um, heat flow is required for models, ice sheet models. It's a boundary condition. And those sorts of models are how we predict what, what might happen um, to the ice sheet into the future. So that's, that's a, sort of a very important application, but it can also provide in, uh, insight into the tectonic evolution. So we can't easily make heat flow measurements in Antarctica, um, not only because the bedrock is so difficult to access, but also because of just the log logistical difficulties in drilling in such a, like a cold, hostile environment that's environmentally sensitive as well. But we can estimate it in a number of ways. So it can be derived from deep um, boreholes in the ice, and they're in um, blue on this diagram. Uh, and so we can extrapolate those thermal properties to the bedrock. Um, but there's large uncertainties depending on the amount of extrapolation, whether the ice sheet is actually frozen to the bed at that point. Um, we can also take measurements in unconsolidated sediments, mainly around the margin, but also in subglacial lakes uh, onshore. And they're, they're um, valuable because there's quite a few of them, but they can be affected by hydrothermal circulation and also climate signals. Um, we can use distribution of subglacial lakes to give us some constraints on heat flow. Um, and even ice sheet models themselves, we can invert them for information about basal heat. But we have to then separate geothermal heat from other sources of heat, like frictional heating that the, the ice sheet is creating itself. So given these constraints, um, the uncertainties on heat flow in Antarctica are very large, and local measurements that are available may not be very representative regionally. So if we want, to, um, if, if we want Antarctic heat flow at a continent scale, we can use geophysical models as thermal proxies, some examples here on the right. Um, and these include magnetic models and seismic models, but there's very large differences between them, as you can see in this figure below, which looks at the difference between um, the two figures on the, the two models on the right there. So this was basically the state of play when I started my role. We began by organizing a workshop in Hobart, um, and that brought again, Brought together geologists, uh, geophysicists, glaciologists, ice sheet modelers um, from around the world and that kind of got us started about what, what we needed to, to solve in the coming years and that also led us to, to establish a working group under SCAR um, which has been very active with a white paper last year and um, some review papers. So the differences between those geo geophysical models, they're probably to be expected because the techniques are actually sensitive to different properties um, at various depths in the lithosphere. So the, um, for example, the magnetic and seismic proxy methods, they're sensitive to, to temperatures in, in the lower crust and mantle, but they rely on uh, assumptions of what's happening in, in the crust and upper crust. And they rely on assumptions on um, thermal properties like heat production and thermal 
thermal conductivity that can be really variable uh, to compute that sort of surface heat flow. So this is um, some of Alicia Pollitt's work from UniSA. Alicia took some new heat flow measurements from the Campana province of Australia in here, um, and then provided an update uh, compilation of heat flow for Gondwana. And the model that she, she did a reconstruction here, and then put one of the models um, that was available for Antarctica, I think this is the magnetic model here for comparison. So we can use global heat flow data to guide our expectations of what we should expect in Antarctica and what variability we should expect. And as I mentioned, the crust is really missing from those geophysical models. So um, we've been working on this aspect in particular. Um, we've been looking at radiogenic heat producing elements in the crust um, and how they vary with lithology. So we teamed up with Alex Burton Johnson um, and Bass um, to look at uh, the Antarctic Peninsula. He'd compiled all sorts of geochemical data um, and had done a lot of mapping and we were able to combine those sets of information, integrate that with some seismic data and, and provide a new heat flow model for the peninsula. And we, that study suggested that up to 70% of heat flow could come from the crust in the, in the Antarctic Peninsula. So using constant values for crustal parameters is really not viable, which is what's been happening in previous um, modelling work. And we've expanded that to more broadly across um, Antarctica in a Gondwanan context. Um, again, we can use constraints from better known continents like Australia and India, Africa, uh, and use that to our advantage in Antarctica. And we're also exploring the variability in heat production with um, various parameters such as age, shown here, lithology, tectonic setting, so that we can extrapolate heat production in an informed way into the, into the continent. And in compiling this geochemical information, we've also been capturing other information where we can find it, including petrology, um, geochronology as well. Um, and we've created a new database, or we're creating a new database called Petrocon Antarctica. And this work's been led by Guillaume Sanchez. It builds from the excellent global database that um, Matt Gard and Derek Kastorov have put together from Adelaide Uni, um, which contains over a million entries. And we've computed rock properties as well from the geochemical information. And we're working with the team at UDSA, Stefan Peters and Tom Romando, um, to make a web portal for this information for public release. So we're hoping to be able to launch this in the coming weeks. And um, so interested folks can come in and um, explore the data, share the data, download the data, have a look at different overlays, um, and, and, um, and hopefully it'll be applicable to all sorts of sciences. So the final research highlight I want to show here is again led by Tobias. He's recently developed a new heat flow model, which is quite a different approach to the way that um, to the models I've shown previously. It's called a similarity pro approach and it use, uses data sets that are available for Antarctica, such as the MOHO depth, the lab depth, topography and so on, and ma then matches them with records that can be associated with high quality heat flow elsewhere on Earth. So the resulting um, heat flow map is shown here, it's called AQ1. And it shows higher heat flow in Western Antarctica versus East Antarctica, which is what we would expect given our understanding of the tectonic development of the continent. And the highest values actually correlate with volcanic centers, particularly in the East Thwaites Pine Island Glacier area, which is one of the um, fastest retreating areas of Antarctica. Um, We've also got some elevated spots in East Antarctica around the Gaussberg volcano is one example. And that's really quite a poorly understood area, but we've, we do have some recent data to suggest it did erupt about 20,000 years ago. So it, and it may be a bit of a more regional volcanic area. So that may have an impact on heat flow in that area. And we can compare it to the previous heat flow models. There's some important differences which are informative. And I'll just point out the, the difference map here is um, a, a model that Toby developed in a different contribution, which looks at the steady state thermal um, model for Antarctica. And so the difference between AQ1 and this one probably points to areas where there's neotectonic activity or volcanic activity. That's important um, contributions to heat flow. So it's got a number of advantages, this new model. It's high resolution. It's got uncertainty metrics um, associated with it, which is really important for the modelers who want to run, say, end member scenarios or ensemble models. Um, and it can be continuously updated, um, this sort of framework, and Toby's working on a new 
a new iteration at the moment. And so it's already being used or is being used in ice sheet modeling sensitivity studies now. So I'm just going to finish with a few reflections on my career. And I really enjoyed learning some more about other presenters, especially um, the um, this talk that Lorna gave a couple of months ago. So I've adapted her um, academic career graph here. Um, so yeah, thanks for being so open with your experiences. It really helps, well, certainly helped me um, to hear those, those perspectives. But I guess if I was to illustrate what my career might look like um, since my PhD, it would look something maybe like this with citations as like a crude proxy for work success. And that's the kind of measure that our university system might recognize. So you know, I've started from a fairly low bar and I've had done some hard work and I've had more collaborators and HDR students and kind of you know managed to have an upwards trajectory. Um, I did some fun work in Tassie, was on the Catalyst program. I was fortunate to be involved with a, um, a project with Ross Larger. We won a Eureka Prize a couple of years ago for um, interdisciplinary research on some work we were doing with the pyrite as a proxy for ocean conditions. And so generally things are head, heading along okay on that perspective. But then this is my kind of real life trajectory. Um, so this is kind of this is kind of like my feels <laughs> about things behind the scenes. Um, and so coming out of out of my PhD, as I mentioned, I moved to Hobart and I thought that would be temporary, maybe 12 months maximum. Um, but I, I didn't have a job. I managed to get first a six month contract at UTAS working with Tony Crawford on the Naturalist Plateau. And that's led to a whole bunch more projects on rifted margins and microcontinents that I could never have forecast um, at that time. Once I was in the door at UTAS, I picked up all sorts of contracts with um, mainly with the ARC Research Center of, uh, Center of Excellence, sorry, in water deposits as it was known at the time. And I worked on rocks in the US, uh, Africa, Zambia, Southeast Asia. Um, but at the same time, I was teaching at Sydney Uni. I was teaching um, at Macquarie Uni. I was running field trips in Central Australia. And I was doing small research um, roles with Macquarie Uni on New England, Origin, uh, New Zealand, PNG. So at times, I was working three jobs at once during these early years. And I was trying to just keep lots of doors open, but it was becoming quite stressful. I didn't get a chance to go to any conferences. I was getting sort of further from the expertise that you know I'd graduated with. Um, and during that time, I applied for a couple of fellowships, including two DECRA applications, which failed. I was feeling pretty gutted. Um, and especially I got feedback from my research office that I've never been able to forget that said that my multiple contracts across three different unis didn't show loyalty to the University of Tasmania. So I was like dumbstruck by that one. Um, so at that point, like my, my partner was working in academia as well. We were both trying to find jobs together. Um, he got offers overseas and I missed out and it just it just wasn't really coming together for us. I felt stuck in a, in a loop at this time. But there was a turning point for me, probably around 2014, where the curve starts to go up. Um, and that was about seven years after I finished my PhD. I was doing some really fun research on Tasmania. I was part of the TEPO team with Ross. Um, I was started to work with Anthony Reid at the GSSA for a little bit and got to learn about South Australian geology. Um, I went to my first conference since my PhD after seven years, finally. <laughs> I went to Goldschmidt in 2014. And I finally landed a three year postdoc with INAS to work on Antarctic geoscience at this time as well. And for me, three years felt like a lifetime. Like finally, now I was gonna do like a proper postdoc, working in a team on just one thing. Um, so it was very exciting. Um, but there were other things that I also knew that I wanted, like a family. And I hadn't really felt like there was room for that yet uh, in my career so far. So my little boy was born soon after um, in, in 2016 and life was pretty full. But you can see that my life takes a few wild rides at the point. Um, and I'm really kind of starting to come out of that now, I think. So I'm definitely an introvert and a fairly anxious person by nature. And I'd always wondered, like, how was I going to go with the pressures of being a mum? And sleep deprivation was every bit of hell as, as I kind of thought it could be. Well, more, actually. <laughs> um, and when I was on leave with my little baby, 
I was suffering with that. And also my father got sick very suddenly and, and died quite quickly. So um, that was a huge shock. And when I got back to work, so I took the six months off, um, I went back to work and I just wasn't well. I was um, just racked with anxiety. I mean, um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of pretty big on imposter syndrome most of the time, but, but I just couldn't think straight. Um, I didn't have any recall. I was emotional and I just couldn't fo focus. And I think, well, a lot of the problem was that my postdoc hadn't paused while I was on maternity leave. The timeline was still going and I just thought, I'm running out of time. I'm, I'm starting to panic. Um, you know, this is my one chance, all that kind of thing. And so it was, it was kind of horrible. Um, and after about 15 months, I mean, things had started to get better with sleeping with my baby. But after about 15 minute, months, he decided to start waking every night for the next three months. So I just um, got to this really, really low point with sleep deprivation that um, I think it was, yeah, I was preparing a talk for a conference actually in this time. And I just got to a point where I had a panic attack and it just, it got too much for me. So this is my low point down here. Um, and I, I definitely, I got some professional help at this point and, and things have started to get better. Um, so yeah, I was lucky to fall pregnant again um, on this upward trajectory. I have a little girl now, she was born in 2019. Um, but before she was born, my mother got very sick. And so my brother and I became primary carers for my mother in Melbourne. So I was um, in Melbourne a lot on leave looking after her uh, and then she died. Um, and so my little baby was born uh, here, 2019, which has been a savior, but I was really devastated that my mom didn't get to meet her. Um, and yeah, so the shock, I think the shock of losing my, both my parents and having two babies <laughs> in the last few years has been, had a huge impact on my life um, in ways that I couldn't have predicted. Um, so, yeah. Um, so I think what's happened with, with baby number two, of course, there was sleep de deprivation, but what, what the big difference was, was that I didn't put the pressure on myself to keep working during that maternity leave time. And the reason I could do that is that my job at IMS had become a continuing position. So I suddenly felt like I actually could have some proper leave. Um, of course, you know, I could check in on my students and do a bit here and there, but it was kind of the ball was in my court and that made an absolutely huge difference um, between the two um, baby experiences that I had. So I guess I've been thinking about what a career is and I think mine is poor, more probably aligned with the verb um, like I've been careering around in a very uncontrolled way. Um, but it's also a very significant period of a person's life. And I have to keep reminding myself of that and making sure that, you know, I'm extracting the best that I can out of it. Um, and I think reflecting now on the difficulties of all those early years, like never sort of moving fields a lot, not quite finishing anything, um, having those hangover projects, those feelings of guilt. Um, it's, it was very difficult on those fixed term contacts. And I know that's, uh, you know, a reality for a lot of ACRs. And I really feel that quite um, intently, intensely. <laughs> and, and so I'm, I'm kind of recalibrating at the moment to what having a continue, continuing position looks like and how I can kind of make that more sustainable part of my life, this career thing as an academic. Um, I haven't worked it out yet. I'm still working that bit out, but definitely people, I think are number one in, in kind of like modulating how, how that goes for me and, and keeping, keeping that enjoyment in my career. So on that note, I wanna thank all my mentors, my collaborators, some of them are listed in that bubble there. And of course, all the funding agencies that have funded the work that I presented today. Thanks very much, Melanie. Thank you so much, Jackie. That was uh, an, an absolutely amazing talk. I think um, that, is, you know, that the whole thing was so amazing, but that last part um, about your career trajectory, I think that a lot of people can relate to that. And um, I think a lot of people don't talk about their struggles and that makes it 
harder for people who are struggling to not feel alone. So it's really important, um, really important conversation. So thanks so much for sharing that with us. And I think that, you know, the people that you mentor and collaborate are just so um, lucky to have you on their team and on their side, absolutely. So um, we'll go now to questions um, and you can, people can write those into the chat uh, or you can unmute yourselves and just sing out and that's fine as well. Um, I did notice right at the very start, there was a question, um, I think from Paul, yeah, about asking where the rocks in your first slide were from. Yeah, that's a great, great location. I love that photo. It's um, Rum Doodle, very famous um, area just above Mawson Station on the plateau. It's, it's made up of the Mawson Tarnakite. Um, and yeah, it's pretty spectacular outcrop there um, we were able to, to ramble around for a couple of days climbing up and down and getting getting some nice samples um, actually that wasn't where I was supposed to be for my PhD I was supposed to be several hundred kilometers up the road <laughs> and that's another story but um, yeah we did end up working on on that China kite because that's where we could get to that year um, but great great scenery absolutely um, there's a I'll send you the chat um, afterwards if you if you don't have access to it now, because there's lots of outrage about that comment from your research office, um, yeah. which was like, God, I can't even, loyalty, that's insane. Um, but, and there's also lots of um, appreciation for uh, that last part of your talk and saying what an amazing mentor you are as well to other people. So that's, um, yeah, that's really nice to read. Um, yeah, I was thanks. interested, um, I was interested uh, when you're talking about, I mean, I think that you've solved the problem of not having outcrops in lots of different, or not having many outcrops in lots of different novel ways. Um, so I was intrigued that uh, paper that you wrote with Jack Mulder, how you had the sediment samples, and you said that you accessed, you they were quite old. How did you get the idea to, to, to get those samples? How did you hear about those samples? I mean, it's such an innovative way to get at that question. Um, yeah, no, that's right. I'm just, I'm just really annoyed people by emailing them and like, you know, I mean, people online probably have got lots of emails from me like, what's in the basement at your university? Um, where can I get this? You know, I, and in fact, for those sediments, they actually came from an NSF database so the Americans actually put money into this and they have what's called the polar rock repository which is this awesome resource um, which is sort of the way we're trying to go with this Petrocon Antarctica initiative is just to make um, samples and data discoverable so they have NSF funding and they've done that for collections in the US and so you can literally look at a map and see where samples are and you can put them in your shopping cart and you can check them out and then they send them to you <laughs> oh my god <laughs> um, and you can like filter from you know sediments or rocks or whatever um of course you know you have to say what you're going to do with them and you know give a little science rationale and 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 um acknowledge them and so on but you know it's a fantastic resource so they they have this interface but they also have the the data story uh, the physical storage to go with it so we were able to I, I discovered that there were these cores I didn't know anything about them until I looked on this map um, I discovered that there was enough material to do what we needed to do and we went from there so yeah I think Australia would be great if we could do something with our legacy collections like the Americans have been able to do and I've kind of been pushing for that um here in some ways like we're starting with the UTAS collection trying to get that online and, and so that it can be shared and then hopefully if we can um get other departments because there's huge Antarctic rock collections in Australia getting buried in you know basements getting thrown out unfortunately um in people's garages you would not believe the stories that I have come across about where Antarctic samples are um oh, yeah so I think it's there's a lot out there there's a lot more we could do if we knew that where they were <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely I got I can just see everyone's hearts breaking at that thought of all those samples <laughs> unaccounted for um, we've got a question from um, Marissa um, if you want to unmute yourself and ask Marissa go for it g'day guys hi Jackie hi Melanie um, hi, this is this is my honours student Steph too so we're kind of um, together um, 
Uh, we're joining from the University of New England and I uh, wanted to say hi from Luke Milan, who was in one of those pictures apparently earlier. <laughs> yeah. He's a bit unwell yeah. at the moment, so he's not in. Um, and thank you so much, Jackie, for sharing all of, all of those things at the end of your talk. For people sort of on that journey, you know, at any stage, even people at the very beginning, it's so important to hear those sorts of like realities about what it's like. Um, but my, my question, and I don't even know if it's a good one, but I was wondering right at the very beginning when you had a, a it was an image of the a cross section of the Gumbertsev Mountains. Yep. And that they're under ice, but they seem so, so sharp. Um, mm. And I, it made me wonder about um, the weathering, the weathering of these kinds of um, rocks in Antarctica and how ice is a, affecting those kinds of processes. I'd never really thought about it before. And if you're doing um, uh, or, or sampling unconsolidated sediments, how does weathering in an ice covered landscape affect the kinds of sediments that you collect? Yeah, that's a great question. And I hadn't really thought about it either until the last little while. So, so from my understanding in the Gap Birds of Mountains, the ice is actually frozen to bedrock there. So it's really not moving mm -hmm. very far in that area, um, which is why those rugged mountain peaks have preserved the way they are. Um, so to get that um, unconsolidated sediment that till you need that uh, you need the subglacial hydrology networks to to um, help that erosional process so where we get that kind of material is is where we where we have sliding at the base mm -hmm. um, and so but just mapping out where that is you know there's that's difficult so there's some emerging techniques using um, seismic data sets for example um, so Anya Redding at UTAS is working on using um, passive seismic in, in novel ways to look at what's happening at that ice bed interface and whether we can map out um, subglacial sediments in that way. Um, you, we can see them sometimes in radar imagery, um, but we don't really have a good handle on their distribution. And then we can eventually sample them on at the coast as well. So it, that material gets entrained in in the, the bottom of the ice and then as as ice is carved off the front of ice shelves that material eventually drops out and sinks mm -hmm. to the bottom of the ocean which is where we're able to sample it um, around the margins. That's it. thank you, thank you very much. Thanks Marissa, great question. Um, yeah. So we've got some questions in the chat which I will read out as well. Um, so Paul asks, do you think that, um, do you think oroclines are present in Antarctica given the flourishing of these in the Tasman Islands? Yeah, it would be great to sort of try and tackle those kind of questions. So I haven't kept up with the latest, to be honest, on the Australian Oroclone um, research, but my understanding is that paleomag is kind of key to, to, to figuring out how these Oroclones work. Um, and so that would be, it would be really great to have more paleomag constraints from Antarctica, just in general, but also to answer that question. Um, so I think, you know, I think that's, that's something that could be done. So the, I guess the, the Eastern Australian oroclone um, equivalents would be in, in the sort of eastern, eastern part of East Antarctica. So around the, the Ross origin parts, the Transantarctic Mount, the basement of the Transantarctic Mountains. And that, that area, there is a lot of work in that area. It's done by um, nations that sort of lay claim to those regions. So New Zealand, um, Italy, um, the Italians do a lot of work in there. Some, the French don't go that much, that far over. Um, I'm trying to think what other nations. So Australia isn't very active in those regions because we don't have the research stations there. But of course that doesn't stop us doing, doing research in those areas. We just, we just don't have the capacity to really get on the ground very easily. Fair enough, yeah. Um, we have a question from Indrani, uh, which is, what is the best advice you ever received during the early career struggles? Yeah, that's a good question, Indrani. Um, I don't really know. Oh, I'd have to reflect on that one. But I definitely um, I really appreciated 
the the senior academics that um, could sort of speak plainly and were genuine. Like I, I, I haven't been hugely impressed with sort of um, leadership figures that um, the more traditional kind of academic hierarchy um, leadership styles is just um, something that I found hard to relate to, but definitely um, I was lucky with my some of my early mentors that, you know, we just could speak really openly and genuinely. And, um, you know, I think not always did they understand what um, ECR pressures were um, or are these days, because quite different to how things were for many professors when they started out. Um, so I did have to try and kind of explain that a bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, the best advice. I think early on I was encouraged to collaborate and that's something that, you know, has really stuck with me and held me in good stead um, and something that I enjoy anyway. So that, that was encouraged early rather than, you know, worrying about um, competition or that sort of thing. I was encouraged to, during my PhD even, to, you know, to go to other labs and team up with other people and, and probably starting well on that foot has, has helped, I'd say. Yeah, cool. That's something that came through in your talk and in Lorna's talk as well, that you're doing academia in a different way, in a more collaborative way, in a way where you really love your mentoring role for other people and love working with other people. And, and it's really working. Like when you're, you're authentic, you're doing the, the work the way that you want to do it, that's when it works best for you. So that, I think that's a really inspiring message for people to hear. I think it's really cool. Um, I noticed why you talked about um, sort of in the early career stages, you did quite a bit of um, high, really high impact science communication. So Catalyst, uh, the Eureka Prize. And I noticed as well that you're really active on Twitter as well. Um, so I was wondering, you know, what you think the benefits of being engaged in like science communication um, and, you know, I guess, social media type things as well. If you think that there are benefits for scientists and early career scientists in doing that, or if you think it's just sort of a part, more a part of the job that sort of everybody is obliged to do, or did you see any benefits from doing that? Yeah, I definitely see benefits, but I also am conflicted about it because I am like naturally an introvert and I just do have a problem with social media in a way. Like I, I still haven't worked out um, how to make it part of my work life so I only recently joined Twitter and it was really fun having these conversations the last few days about geology and I have joined it for work purposes um, and I can see how that works really well and speaking to people like Sandra McLaren she was saying that she uses a lot for her teaching and I can really see how how that's you know a great resource um, yeah so social media I'm I, I just don't know. <laughs> it, it doesn't sit hugely comfortably with me. Um, but science communication more broadly, um, you know, I've I kind of grown at it because that's just the introvert in me, like just like, oh, I don't want to talk about it. But then when I do it and when there's the opportunities to do it, I do really enjoy it and, and it's worth it. And so I think forcing um, myself to try and communicate with different audiences has made you know me a better scientist and probably just a more interesting person in general so um I think it's it, it's definitely it does pay off but it doesn't come naturally to me I'm not um not one of those people that that, that likes the sound of my own voice necessarily <laughs> so yeah yeah I can I definitely sympathise with that. Like that graph you had on the what towards the end of the slide, where the things that I can't remember what it was, but the things that I regret saying, and it's like nobody noticed, and you know everyone's already forgotten. But yeah, I definitely after a, a uh, science communication sort of experience, it's like I'm the sort of person who's running over in your head afterwards, going, "Oh, I shouldn't have said that." And yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, there are so many, you know, increasingly more opportunities. People are getting more and more um, creative with how they communicate. And I think it's great. Um, and I think, you know, the, the days of like the press release are kind of like where it stopped, that those days are over. It can be a lot more creative now. And I see that in um, ECRs and students coming through. They're, they're a lot more visual with their science and, um, yeah, a lot more creative. It's great. 
Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, it makes Twitter a really exciting place to be for academics, I think, when people are active like that. All right, we have um, reached sort of the end of our hour time slot, um, unfortunately, because it's great to hear from you today, Jackie, um, to hear about your career and about your work. It was an excellent um, talk. I think we can all agree on, on that, absolutely. So, um, yeah, we'll bring this uh, our August Mesa seminar to a close. Um, and yeah, just thanks once again, Jackie, for talking to us today. Thanks, Melanie. Thanks, everybody.